Great. Well, thanks, Nathan and Petar and Mama. Uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share what is a new research project of mine. So this is really work in progress. And I immediately have a problem, which is this project has somehow exploded uh, in the last month of working on it. So I won't be able to read you a kind of elegant, nicely composed paper. Instead, I will be talking more about the paper in a compressed way. And I just want to share with you uh, some of the main thematics, arguments I want to make, and to explain why I think, so the story, Investigations of a Dog, is such a crucial story in Kafka's work, and what's at stake philosophically in this story. So in fact, my claims, my arguments are, are quite ambitious. I'm not exactly sure if I can back them up right now, but I will simply state them in the most ambitious way possible. First, I think this is the story in all of Kafka's work which provides a kind of guide or key or roadmap to understanding the entirety of his uh, fictional universe. So this is the one story where Kafka, I think quite self-consciously, attempts to systematically account for all his themes and obsessions and to put them into some kind of relation. So already I think this is quite fascinating. Secondly. Uh, if you haven't read this story before, it's essentially the story of a dog as a scientist, or even better, a dog as a philosopher. And I would like to make the argument that as a philosopher, I would put myself on the side of the dog. I think that the dog proposes a research project that has gone unrealized, and somehow we should become friends of this dog and try to carry on with his research. So I think uh, Kafka formulates an absolutely novel uh, philosophical problematic uh, in this story that we can read so in a philosophical way and try to actualize in, in a new manner. Okay. I will skip, I have a few illustrations, I will skip here. If I go all the way to the end of the story, what you'll find in the last pages is an attempt, so the dog gives a kind of systematic account which is, in a way, a kind of parody of a kind of German idealism, but a systematic account of different forms of sciences and the domains of inquiry, which I think map quite nicely onto Kafka's own okay, themes and obsessions. So let me tell you a little bit about this story. So it's from the end of Kafka's career. It was written in 1922, it was, or it was found anyway in one, of the, uh, in one of the notebooks. So it's an unfinished, unpublished story. Uh, towards the end of his, so Kafka dies in 1924, so it's towards the end of his career, not his last work. So his last stories are Josephine the Singer, or the Mouse People, and the, and the Burrow. So, but towards the end of his career, it was not published in his lifetime. Max Brod published it and gave it its title, which I think is a very good title. Uh, in English, Investigations of a Dog, in German, Forschungen eines Hundes. Now, uh, probably a better, more accurate translation would be research of a dog. And the reason why is, I think, Forschung in, in German has more of a connotation of a kind of academic work. It's not like a police investigation. So we're not in the milieu of the trial or of the law. We're rather in the university or the academy. Now, there's a close connection between this story and a report to an academy. So in a report to an academy is the story of an ape who narrates his kind of miraculous transformation via this act of desperate mimetism into a man. So the ape becomes a man and is giving a kind of address before a distinguished scholarly audience like yourselves and is, and is trying to explain how he became a man. So this story though is quite different from that one even though they, they, they're both somehow about the university, they're both about the production of knowledge and in a way, they both provide a satire of what Lacan called the university discourse, so the norms that govern the production of knowledge. However, in a report to an academy, the ape remains a kind of witness giving testimony. The ape is still the object of science, the thing to be studied. How is it possible to make that transition? And the scientists are there in a kind of to listen and to judge. In this story, it's the dog himself who is the subject of science who actually sets the research agenda and conducts his own experiments. So that's also why this story is quite um, unique and interesting. Okay. Uh, 
What is the philosophical project that's unrealized in this work? Let me read just a small passage. So, my paper. So, I, when I was working, when I was thinking about this story, I realized. So it's an unpublished work. It's usually not considered one of Kafka's best stories, if I can say that. I mean, okay. Usually, everybody loves all of Kafka, but it's 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 received a sort of more reserved critical judgment, um, precisely because it's quite long, it's rather rambling, uh, it's hard to grasp its thematic unity. So compared to stories like A Hunger Artist or The Metamorphosis, it really lacks this kind of polishness and kind of exquisite composition. I think precisely for that reason, precisely because it's a sort of flawed masterpiece, it can provide a sort of unique insight into the construction of Kafka's universe. So that's kind of my, my way into it. Now, traditionally, the story can be read in different ways. I think on the one hand, we can read it as a kind of Bildungsroman. So it's a story of a young dog, a puppy, who explains how he became a philosopher, what event led him you know, to become obsessed with research, um, then kind of different episodes in his life. He grows up, he adopts a kind of properly adult attitude, he, he engages in a serious project or quest. Um, a wonderful line from the story is very short. At one point the dog says, there are more important things than childhood. On the other hand, you can read it, and it has been read by Marthe Robert as a uh, allegory of Kafka's Jewishness. So you, if you read this, you see the dog community is unified. The dogs want to live together in one giant heap, and yet no community of, of no, there's no other community that's so dispersed throughout the world with so many different occupations. So in a certain way, Kafka is describing the Jewish community and also the, the dog himself is a, is a kind of alienated, alienated from the rest of the dog race, is constantly trying to meditate on, is he a dog? Yes, he is. is there a, what is the nature of this slight difference, that his slight maladjustment, as he calls it? So it's also been read as an allegory for Judaism. Okay, I'm less interested in that. The third way of reading the story is as a uh, animal fable. So the problem of the relationship between the human and the animal. Um, which I think this story provides also a unique way. That's how I'll try to conclude, if I have time, some, with some reflections on the meaning of Kafka's anthropomorphic animals and animalian humans. What's at stake there? But the fourth way to read the story, so th what I would like to propose is um, I would like to read it in a somewhat violent and non-literary way, just as if it was a straight sort of philosophical treatise, or at least that would be the experiment. And in a way, you know, Walter Benjamin once commented, so in his great essay on Kafka, you know, one of his questions was, why is Kafka a writer of parables and not a theologian? What prevented Kafka from being a, a mystic? And my question would be, well, why is Kafka a writer of parables and not a philosopher? Like, what stopped him from being a philosopher when you see the kind of depth of reflection he was capable of in this, in this story? So, so both here and in the report to the Academy were presented with, I think, a brilliant and sometimes quite hilarious parody of the kind of norms that govern scientific research, production of knowledge, again, this idea of a university discourse. And indeed, if there's one word to describe today's sort of neoliberal management of the university with all these review mechanisms and corporate directives and administrative layers, it certainly is Kafka-esque. And in fact, Mark Fisher, in his book on capitalist realism, I think quite brilliantly brings out the sort of Kafka-esque structure of the neoliberal governance of the university. But that's not the point I want to make. I want to make a different argument. I, I think not only was Kafka a kind of prescient diagnostician of our hyper-bureaucratic times, but he was also the theorist of an alternative science, another way of thinking, even perhaps of a way out. So against this kind of Kafka-esque neoliberal management of the university, we have the revolutionary studies of Kafka's dog. So what would be, this would be my kind of rhetorical question, what would be the kind of academy or the new university or the enlightened institute of the future that could accept the investigations of a dog as a veritable research program? So what if we were to take the animal's scholarly career with its hallucinatory visions, paradoxical speculations, and extreme form of self-experimentation seriously? So in the guise of writing about a lone canine's attempt to come to grips with his peculiarities and with those of his world. So that is, in chronicling uh, the thinker's dogged pursuit of his alienation, his incapacity, quote, 
to live in harmony with my people and to accept in silence whatever disturbs that harmony, end quote. I think Kafka comes closest to giving us his philosophical, uh, his philosophical manifesto. And it's quite interesting that you could say that the dog reports, so there's already a kind of, let's say, spontaneous science of the dog world and a quite well-developed science. And the dog is putting himself in opposition to kind of existing science. And you could say that the dog's criticism of knowledge of his day or the dog's criticism of science is simply that it's too dogmatic. So he wants to reopen up and pose different kinds of questions. Now, again, let me just give you a very brief summary. So because the story is quite long. If I was to really boil it down, there's essentially, just to give you a kind of overview, so there's essentially five episodes in this story and there's two parables. So let me say, one of my ambitions in this project is I would like to give an integral reading of the story. So the, the essays that exist, I mean, usually take one part or another. And I would like to sort of account for every bit of this story and not leave out certain elements. So the basic episodes in this story is there's a scene of musical dogs. Yeah. There's the musical dogs. There is the soaring dogs. There's a wonderful Yiddish joke in this story, which I'll tell you about. There is the story of the dog's fast. Then there's a scene, so the dog goes on a fast. He almost dies. He wakes up in a kind of a dream state and he's confronted with a hunting dog and they have an exchange, so that's the penultimate scene. And then at the very end, you get the dog's attempt to systematize knowledge. So the dog's sort of philosophical system or what I was calling Kafka's system of science. Along the way, you have two parables, each of which you could spend quite a bit of time trying to interpret. The parable, the so-called parable of the bone marrow and then there's the dialogue of the two sages. So these would be the kind of different elements, um, the story. But to grasp the story, so there's really, it's really structured by one joke that goes through the entire story. So one sort of colossal joke. And that is, in the dog's universe, humans don't exist. So in dog's world, there are no humans. Um, it's not that they're not there, but they're just literally invisible. The dog has no sense for human beings. So you could say that the dogs have a kind of caninocentric worldview. And in a weird way, humans are the kind of elephant in the room, if you want. Like, humans are simply not there. And that produces all sorts of surreal and bizarre descriptions um, of the dog's universe. So on a phenomenological level. When the dog is trying to explain certain problems, phenomena, they, it produces extremely extravagant and strange descriptions which can be simplified, solved very easily if you simply add the human into the equation. So this is kind of Kafka's joke throughout the story. I'll give you the, the, the examples. In the first scene of the musical dogs, and this accounts for the kind of origin of, of how the dog became a philosopher, um, he, he says, so just to summarize, he comes across a troop of seven dogs. They, they're, they're singing and dancing, but they're producing music without even singing as if they're conjuring music out of the air. And then, lo and behold, miraculous for a dog, they're standing upright, and so forth and so forth. And the dog is struck by this music. He's overwhelmed by it. He tries to ask the dogs questions about it. They don't respond, and it creates this kind of... So there's a very complex scene. Now, in a sense, all that's happening there is that the dog has come across, perhaps, a, a troop of trained you know, dogs. Even he talks about the seventh dog being a little bit maladroit and not really participating as excellently as the other dogs in the performance. That could very well be, you know, the human performer who's dressed up like a dog. Uh, found this image in a wonderful book of Amphitheater on the, the, I think, La Merveilleuse Histoire du Cirque or something like this. So this is a kind of image from the circus. But in any event, there's ex this extravagant kind of description of this, this um, meeting with the musical dogs, but of course, the human reader can enjoy this kind of joke that it's simply a very banal uh, situation, that he's come across sort of a circus troupe. More interesting, uh, maybe even a more interesting use of this joke would be in the episode of the soaring dogs and in the problem of food. Uh, the soaring dogs, sorry, I'm just giving a quick summary. Uh, the middle section and maybe the, the most delightful part of the story is when the dog says, of all the strange things in the dog universe, none is stranger than soaring dogs. So dogs that fly. Uh, the German term is Lufthunde. 
Lufthunde. Now, Lufthunde, it's not really a German term, it's really a Yiddish term. Lufthunde is a play on Luftmensch. Uh, Luftmensch is a Yiddish term that really means, so the people who live in the air, but so somebody who has no practical sense for the world and is usually used to qualify artists or intellectuals, people whose heads are in the clouds and so forth, but they have no practical sort of capacity, they can't earn money and so forth. Um, if one was to do a longer commentary on this story, which I do, you should refer to the great uh, dictionary of Leo Rosten on, the, on Yiddish, the joys of Yiddish, and you can get kind of a longer understanding of the, of the problem of the Lufthunde or the soaring dogs. Now, of course, soaring dogs in Kafka's universe, as he, as he explains, are simply um, like little lap dogs of like old ladies that are carrying them around. You know? And so for the dog, it's a kind of miraculous, it, for the dog, it's kind of miraculous. Like, who are these dogs that live in the air? But okay, again, the kind of ironic joke for the human reader is that, you know, these are just old ladies' dogs. This is the postmodern capitalist variant, not old ladies, but young ladies, and apparently this really exists they're called pooch purses, designer pooch purses, so you can carry around your dogs. But if you're, if, you're, if you're a Kafka's dog, you think this is a miracle of flying dogs, and you even eventually pose the problem, these dogs seem to be multiplying, how is it possible that they can make love in the air? So this is one of the kind of jokes of the story. Uh, the last part, so to tell you, and maybe the most exquisite use of this joke is in the problem of feeding. So for a dog, um, the primary concern of dog science is the thing closest at hand. If you want other examples of the Lufthunde, you, you know, if there was to be an illustration of this story, of course, you would have to imagine a Chagall painting with a kind of dog over Vitebsk. Or you could also say that it wasn't, I mean, Laika was the ultimate Lufthunde, certainly, that Kafka somehow had a premonition of the cosmonaut dogs. But okay, anyway, uh, that's just a side. Uh, the most exquisite use of this joke is in the, is in the analysis of uh, food. And as, as the dog will say, that the, he, starts, he starts the problem of science begins with this enigma of music. Where is music coming from? Or the enigma of art or the sublime. But once he's shocked by this kind of sublime encounter, he says, well, what is the real object of science? I mean, for a dog, what are we mostly preoccupied with? Our lives, and our lives are basically a problem of eating food. The most advanced science in the dog world is, is the food science. And at a certain point, he tries to analyze the problem of food. Dog science has, uh, understands uh, the basic precept of dog science is that food comes on the earth. And it comes on the earth when there's some rituals that are uh, performed. Namely, preparing and watering the ground. This is the dog's language for her. And singing. Ritual, actions, movements, and incantation. So in a less exalted language, uh, basically scratching and peeing on the ground and barking and leaping in the air. So this is, the kind of, this is also the kind of joke. Uh, of course, the dog will say that what, what the food science has not explained is, but where does that food come from? What is the origin of this food? The dog asks the question of kind of first principles. So let's say the beginning of dog science, of food science, starts with the question, from whence does the earth procure this food? That's the question he'll repeat. From whence does the earth, whence does the earth procure this food? Now, I just want to make one point about this joke to begin with. Uh, this is part of the kind of, I think, brilliant sort of humorous construction of the story, and it's also Kafka's own kind of estrangement technique, if you want. Uh, this redescription of kind of banal with this device. If humans weren't there, what would these what would these kind of banal phenomena look like? But it's not simply an ironic joke. If we remain on that level, then the story would be confirming the supposed, let's say, presumably human reader in its mastery. That the human reader would be able to master the dog's universe because we're privy to information that the dog is not. Hmm? Uh, I think the joke actually, uh, on, maybe that's the first effect of the joke, but on a kind of second turn, it has a much more um, kind of profound and bizarre alienating effect, which is, well, if the dog's universe is like that, why isn't the hum human universe like that as well? So what if what is a mystery for us, I don't know, freedom, God, whatnot, is just a total evidence for other higher beings that are existing, aliens, whatnot, that we are totally unaware of? 
So what if the human universe was just like the dog's universe? The things that we think are deep mysteries are in fact you know, utter banalities for more advanced beings. So why not relativize the human experience based on this joke? So that would be the second um, movement, I think, in the humor of the story. But then I think there's even a third twist, which is, so it's not that, on the, on the first hand you could say the joke is for us human beings. Then you could say the joke is somehow on us as well. But I think, and another reflection, and this brings more to the philosophical core of the story, it's not that there would be a kind of infinite regress of ever higher beings for whom, you know, the mysteries would be banalities, but that the true mystery would somehow be a split within that being, the one being itself, that it can't master. There's kind of a split in that original being that it can't master, and that that split is reflected most profoundly in the story with, uh, through the relationship between the animal and the human being. Okay, I'll get to that at the very end. Let me go through the story of the eating. So just to give you, and part of what I would do in the reading of the story is to show how different aspects really fulfill so different philosophical programs. So for instance, um, I think the dog project is resolutely modern in two ways. On the one hand, the dog will say, philosophy begins with the simplest things. And in a certain way, he's repeating like the fundamental tenet of like Husserlian phenomenology, that you don't begin philosophy with either a kind of inflated uh, abstract concepts or conceptual schemas, but you begin by attending to the things themselves and the most banal, simple things. So that philosophy doesn't respect a hierarchy of beings in its initial move, but that philosophy starts with the simplest things. You also find that, for example, in Plato, already in the Parmenides, that problem, uh, the young Socrates, is, the question is posed, you know, is dirt, mud, and junk, do those have complements in the realm of the forms? And Socrates says, probably not, but Parmenides says, when you're older, you'll understand, for a real philosopher, everything is worth philosophizing about. Nothing falls outside the domain of theory. So you see that the, on the one hand, the dog has a very phenomenological approach. He starts philosophizing with the things at hand or at paw, whatever you want to say. Um, but then he also, when he discusses like the soaring dogs, says there's nothing, so there's nothing so senseless or meaningless or arbitrary that would fall outside the field of my investigations. And here the dog really articulates the Freudian principle that even the most meaningless or senseless thing should be the subject of a rational investigation. And that we shouldn't put things outside the field of reason, but we need to expand the field of reason to include those phenomena we think somehow contravene it. So the dog at once, I think, is a phenomenologist and a psychoanalyst in his methodological principles. So this is kind of the way I developed the story. Let me just focus on one aspect, which I think is maybe the most interesting, or one of the most interesting, and that's the problem of the dog's relation to food. So at a certain point, uh, about two-thirds of the way through the story, the dog is so analyzing this problem of food, and uh, he comes to the conclusion that there's only one real research method for him to get to the bottom of the mystery of food, the relationship to food and where it comes from. And he says, that's fasting. So, and he produced a very lovely sentence. He says, fasting is my, uh, is my uh, he, he calls it a method, a research method. Fasting is my most powerful uh, research method. I can find the exact quotation. So, he engages in a kind of fast, and here my proposition would be the dog is rigorously Cartesian. It's not universal doubt, but somehow fasting. And what's the point of the fasting for the dog? To break his natural relationship to food, to break the orientation of his natural instinct, which is to eat, or as he calls it, his greed for life. He wants to do something to transform his own vitality. Now, in a way, what fasting is then for the dog it's not just he's going to go on a diet or something. What fasting is for the dog is a way of putting out of action or suspending his natural instinct for food. So he kind of has a vital epoche or kind of alimentary suspension of the instinct. So he says this is the most difficult thing you can't imagine. Dogs do not fast. This goes against every sort of precept of dog nature. Um, so he explains how difficult that is for him to fast. And at a certain point, so let me just quickly find, 
that I just have two quotations for you. Yes. So at a certain point in this suffering, a transformation happens. So this is a quotation. He says, that is my hunger, I told myself countless times during this stage, as if I wanted to convince myself that my hunger and I were still two things and I could shake it off like a burdensome lover. But in reality, we were very painfully one. And when I explained to myself, that is my hunger, it was really my hunger that was speaking and having its joke at my expense, end quote. Now, for a psychoanalytically minded reader, this is sort of a textbook illustration of what's called projective identification. It's kind of defense mechanism. If there's something too painful in my bodily reality, I can treat it, so it's not a conscious operation, but I can treat it as if it was not happening to me. So I'm super hungry. At a certain moment, I can say, that's crazy, that hunger. And it's a way of derealizing the hunger and putting it at a certain distance. Of course, the joke is that hunger is still me. So and it persecutes me as a kind of separated partial object. This kind of, so that's what happens to the dog. In order to get through at a certain moment, he says, that's my hunger, my hunger out there persecuting me. But he even persists through that. And then a real transformation takes place. And this is the quotation. In the midst of, quote, in the midst of my pain, I felt a longing to go on fasting and I followed it as greedily as if it were a strange dog, end quote. Now, strange dog in German is actually um, unbekannten Hund. It's not fremde, which he also uses. It's not like a strange, weird, it's more like unknown, I think would be a, maybe a better translation, a kind of unknown dog. And what's interesting here is persisting in his hunger at a certain moment, the hunger itself takes on a life of its own. The hunger itself becomes like a second dog, a mysterious unknown dog, which then sort of takes the dog by its hand. And from that point on, fasting is no longer a problem. So fasting becomes the dog's mysterious kind of partner. It takes him by the hand. He follows this other dog's lead, and he even becomes a fasting addict. So he says, I could not stop. So you know, tremendous effort, difficult effort, kind of becomes a compulsive joy. I can't do it anymore. Now, hmm. maybe to, okay, to summarize that quickly, I think that we can read here a truly remarkable, um, maybe I exaggerated, but okay, uh, quite a remarkable, uh, 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 Kafka, I think, has offered a, a, quite an interesting innovation in the Cartesian project which is not, so it's not a kind of purification of thought. Descartes never thought about this, that you would have two substances, a thinking substance and an extended substance. Thinking substance can be purified in the sense that you can find the one thought that cannot be doubted within thought that can then be the basis for reconstructing. Kafka sort of provides a procedure for the purification of extended substance. What happens here is that fasting is a form of negation of the body. And it's negated to, in this story to the point where the dog is going to die. So he pushes his doubt to the point of a kind of insanity, or he pushes his kind of vital epoche to the point where he would actually come into danger. And again, just like Descartes, you know, as the dog says, this is a non-natural. Fasting for him is a philosophical act. It's non-natural. It takes a great effort. Descartes will say the same thing in meditations, that this kind of philosophical state of mind is not the natural one. I keep slipping back into a more sort of adapted worldview. You also find that in the, probably the most beautiful passages of, about that, about the, unna the unnatural character of philosophy is in Hume, in the treatise on human understanding, at the one point where he says, I should just abandon philosophy and play backgammon. So the dog is also has this kind of asceticism. There's an asceticism of philosophy, at the origin of modern philosophy. There's an asceticism of the dog's research method that he negates the body, reduces the instincts to nothingness, and then what emerges is you can starve everything. The only thing you can't starve is starvation itself. The only thing that remains of the body from the process of starvation is the starvation itself, which then emerges at a kind of transformative moment as a new body. So out of nothingness, a new body emerges, a body of nothingness. That's the unknown dog. Now, the second part of this story, so again, if you can bear with me a little bit longer, after this part of fasting, you get this wonderful parable of the two sages. 
So it's not enough that we just have the relationship to the body and the bodily instincts, let's say, on the level of nature, but we also have to consider this on the level of culture or the law. So the dialogue of the two sages goes like this. It's very short. Uh, the one sage says, fasting is forbidden for dogs. And the second says, sage says, why to forbid fasting? No dog would ever think of fasting. The end. Okay. Then the problem is this. Is fasting forbidden or not? Now, the dog says the kind of standard interpretation of this parable is fasting is not forbidden. Uh, fasting is not forbidden because it's the same way of saying, you know, it's forbidden for human beings to fly. It's just nonsensical. Human beings can't fly. So it's simply impossible to contravene nature. Um, therefore, there's no prohibition. The dog says, in fact, there's a threefold prohibition. So the dog says it's much trickier. This is, this is the quotation from the dog. The first sage wished to forbid fasting. What a sage wishes is already done, so fasting was forbidden. As for the second sage, he not only agreed with the first, but actually considered fasting impossible. So he piled on the first prohibition a second, that of dog nature itself. The first sage saw this and then withdrew the explicit prohibition. That was to say, he imposed on all dogs, the matter now being settled, the obligation to know themselves and to make their own prohibitions regarding fasting. Wonderful formulation. So, end quote. Now, you could say, let's just very quickly look at these three steps. First, there's a kind of external prohibition, which comes from an authority. And the argument here is, as the sage being an authoritative figure, as soon as they mention a law, it becomes law. So you could say, if we want to make a maxim out of this, dogs must not fast. Okay. The second sage then responds by shifting the register from the normative you know, to the descriptive. So there's a kind of, sh and here you would have, you would need a longer commentary, but here there's a, a very funny short circuit between is and ought, if you want. So the second sage says, or the second sage just makes a statement of fact, which then becomes a prohibition. And this prohibition flows not out of the mouth of an authority, of an authoritative sage, but is as if the prohibition was coming from nature itself. So you could probably write that as dogs must not fast because they cannot fast. But the third, sage, uh, the third stage is the most interesting um, because only here do we get this injunction that the dog has to know thyself and to formulate you know, his own law on the basis of that knowledge. So presumably this would read something like, I must not fast because dogs cannot fast. But are we so sure of this? I think with this last movement, which is a movement of subjectivation, things become more complicated. Um, because what we discover at this third stage is neither a kind of externally imposed order, nor do we have a kind of sureness of a kind of inner instinct, but a kind of metamorphosis of the dog into a reflexive agent who is responsible for formulating his own maxims. So instead of investigations of a dog, we have here in a Kantian way, a kind of self-legislation of a dog. So in a way, fasting brings the dog both to a kind of border of nature and to a kind of border of culture. So the birth, Kafka wants to think together, both a transformation or breakup of the body and the birth of normativity. Normativity only existing when we no longer have simply externally imposed orders or kind of natural domain, but a kind of reflexive uh, creation of the law. Okay. Um, how, am I, how much time do I have, Nathan? Within, within five minutes. Okay. Um, then let me try to do two things quickly. I just want to explain to you this schema, and then I'll end with one further example so that I think illustrates what's at stake philosophically. So um, essentially there are four sciences in, in Kafka's universe. The science of nurture, which you could also just call the science of food, is the domain of necessity. So there's necessity, and the necessity is treated in the problem of the fast. Then we have the science of music or art. And what's interesting is in Kafka, the paradigmatic art form is music. It's not literature, as one might surmise. And you know, the crucial references would be, of course, Josephine, which I would read the story together with for a number of reasons. Um, also the borough, also some episodes from the castle. The, the problem of music recurs throughout Kafka's writing. So we have, in a way, necessity and art. So this is not a bad beginning, I guess, for a philosophical system. The most interesting, though, is the transitional science, the science of incantation. 
And the science of incantation is already leaving the level of necessity, but is not, le not yet at the level of art. And basically, in the most simple way, incantation is begging for food, making a demand for food. This is the most primitive kind of art. That's the origin of art, begging for food, demanding food. The, the dog, in order to get food, has to do things like leap into the air, it has to dance, it barks, it pees, whatever. That these are all means to get food. If I had more time or if you want to ask me, I can explain why in a, in a, in a really bizarre way. Um, you know, often people are making this link of Kafka and Freud and, and whatnot, that Kafka really knew his Freud. But in a, in a way, he also knew his Lacan and uh, even anticipates Lacan because you can say the real problem of food, and that's also why Kafka is, is out of tune with today's uh, dominant paradigms of developmental psychology, attachment theory, and phenomenology. The real problem of food, the real relation to food, is the mystery, the relationship to the mystery of the food giver. That's it. That in, in relating yourself to a vital need like food, what really captures you and what really obsesses you and the beginning of your desire is trying to understand my relationship to that agency, which is a totally abstract agency. It's not a full person or a human being you can relate to, but this abstract agency that sometimes gives you food and sometimes doesn't, that appears and disappears, and that you can't really fathom uh, the inscrutable source of food and so forth. So my argument would be the science of incantation, so these, these rituals that the dogs do, is the beginning of dog bureaucracy. And this is showing the genesis in Kafka's fiction of the theory of the law. That the science of incantation in the end is Kafka's theory of the law. That the dogs, by barking, leaping, and systematizing the kind of actions they have to do, are creating a kind of dog bureaucracy. And that this will be the major space of Kafka's fictional universe. So in this kind of system of science, Kafka shows where the law is born and its place. Then that would be a more complicated problem. But at the end, he says, hey, there's even another science, the ultimate science. And that would be the science of freedom. I won't <laughs> tell you anything about that except to say that the, the challenge of interpreting it is that the science of freedom, should it be considered as a fourth science in a hierarchy? Or, okay, so that's my reading. I think the science of freedom is the way in which the other three sciences are related. And the structural similarities between these three sciences, if you can grasp them, would be what freedom is. But let me end with, uh, uh, let me end with a little anecdote. So if I can just flip back. There is a wonderful passage in Sartre in his, great, his last great philosophical work, less studied on Flaubert, so the L'Idio de la Famille. There's a passage where he talks about a pet dog. Okay, to save a bit of time, I won't read this long paragraph, but... Sartre has a truly remarkable phenomenological analysis of a pet dog. And the problem with this pet dog is that he has, well, I read, a, I read a portion of it. He says, household animals are bored. They are dismal reflections of their masters. Culture has penetrated them, destroying nature in them, but without replacing it. Language is their major frustration. They have a crude understanding of its function, but cannot use it. This manifest verbal power which is denied to them cuts through them, settles within them as the limit of their powers. It is a disturbing privation which they forget in solitude and which deprecates their very natures when they are with men. I have seen fear and rage grow in a dog. We were talking about him. He knew it instantly, but nevertheless we were speaking to each other. The dog felt it. Our words seemed to designate him as our interlocutor, and yet they reached him blocked. He did not quite understand either the act itself or this exchange of speech, which concerned him far more than the usual hum of our voices, and far less than an order given by a master. Or rather, for the intelligence of these humanized beasts is always beyond itself, lost in the imbroglio of its presence and its impossibilities. He was bewildered at not understanding what he understood. He began by waking up, bounding towards us, but stopped short, then whined with an uncoordinated agitation and finished by barking angrily. This dog passed from discomfort to rage, feeling at his expense the strange reciprocal mystification, which is the relationship between man and animal." End quote. Now, 
I think this is really a remarkable passage and deserves to be treated, you know, as Sartre's great philosophical figures, like the cafe waiter or like the friend Pierre who's never there in the imaginary and so forth. I think that the dog is another one of these great philosophical characters. And it's even a kind of, he even proposes in the work on Flaubert, a kind of pet existentialism, if you want. And, and it really has a kind of some remarkable ramifications, even on his ontology. But basically, what I think is so interesting here is that the dog, as, as, as Sartre describes him, is kind of in an in-between position. So he's somehow no longer part of nature, no longer part of the, the wild nature. That somehow he's brought into culture, but he doesn't really belong into culture either. And the weird speculation, so you can follow Sartre or not, I have no idea what you should, but the weird speculation there is that the dog is somehow obscurely aware that it's missing something. So the dog can't speak, but it's obscurely aware that it's missing language somehow that it's kind of anticipating something that it still can't theorize. And there's that beautiful phrase, the dog is bewildered at not understanding what he understood, which is, a more, which is really a wonderful formulation of what it means to have an unconscious, that somehow you understand something, but you don't understand it at the same time. Now, I'm like a dog begging for a few, few, few moments to finish this point. Uh, 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 let me skip to a quotation from, uh, from the story. This is Kafka's dog speaking about the community. He says, dogs, I cannot put it any other way. So in the past, he's talking about in former generations. Dogs, I cannot put it any other way, had not yet become so doggish as today. The edifice of dogdom was still loosely put together. The true word still could have intervened, planning or replanning the structure, changing it at will, transforming it into its opposite. And the word was there, was very near, at least on the tip of everybody's tongue. Anyone might have hit upon it. And what has become of it today? Today, one may pluck at one's own heart, or one may pluck one's own heart out and not find it." End quote. So there's a kind of interesting, uh, one could say, uh, interesting symmetry between these two complaints of Sartre's pet dog and Kafka's scientist, philosopher dog. And it's as if, so what is, what is the dog complaining about? You could say, for the Sartre's pet, it's as if it was in front of the gate of culture, but the door is shut. But he knows there's a door there. So that's the bizarre speculation. So the door is shut. The door of culture is shut for, for Sartre's pet. So that's why he's also raging, barking, and just generally bored. Uh, one could say that Kafka's dog, so he's complaining about the community of dogs. For the community of dogs, the door is also shut, but it's shut behind them. So these dogs are already inside of culture, and in a way, they're too doggish, which is another way of saying they're too human. They're simply too at home in their culture, and they've lost the sense for the explosive openness of the tradition to which they belong. And one could then posit that the real object of the dog's inquiry would be, is it possible one could situate oneself it's before this open door. So the door that would neither be shut for, for, for the pet dog, who simply has no access, but would not be shut behind one, but could one grasp this problem of the transition, let's say, between nature and culture at the very moment, at that very moment. And maybe this gives a new way also of reading the parable of, uh, of uh, the man from the country and before the law. Because usually that's read as an extremely melancholic piece that the man comes to the law demanding access and is barred access by a doorkeeper. But one could also say, isn't the miracle of that story that the guy is standing in front of an open door? That the door is actually open to him. And he misrecognizes the idea that there would be some access beyond. But the miracle is he's actually in front of an open door. Now, in the story, this is treated not so much in terms of the metaphorics of doors, but in terms of the problem of silence. But again, that would be, I think, the let's say the improbable, unlikely, very slippery object of the dog's inquiry, this pure moment of transition that perhaps can't be grasped, but the problem is how to make that, let's say, let's say the object of a philosophical uh, inquiry. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.